Welcome to the Seavine News Network. I'm Linda Forsyth, and today I'm going to try something new. This is our premiere episode of our daily evening news. We're going to start doing this every single day. You know, it's been kind of amazing. I found out that um, there's quite a few people that don't realize all the various different aspects of where Seavine is. It's not only we have a very large website uh, that puts out the daily news, breaking news, tribunal news, um, and education, etc., every single day. Uh, and we've got quite a few people who do that, but we also have discussion groups on Facebook, which I know some of you don't like to be on Facebook, but I'll tell you, this has kind of grown pretty big where there is uh, 18,000 people right now that uh, can you know, come together and they discuss the various different news stories on there. Also have a forum on the website that you can go to besides being on Twitter and now doing this on YouTube, which we're gonna be putting this up every single day. Keep in mind everything that I go over um, when we do the daily evening news is also already up on the website. So you can read the full blown stories. What I'm doing tonight is pretty much just going over the highlights. So, and I'd love to have your feedback. In the meantime, before I move forward, if you notice the little subscribe button down there, I'd really appreciate it if you'd click that to help uh, build our subscriber base. And uh, let's get started. Okay, kind of new at this, so I'm going to click the share button and share my screen. Oops, umbrellas. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Thank you for your patience. Okay, the Seavine News Network Daily Evening News. Today is October 17th, 2019. <clears throat> All right, today's highlights, uh, what we're going to be going over is the 9-11 Gitmo briefs, how Barr's decision to release the Saudi officials' names as the 9-11 mastermind has actually helped the Gitmo pre-trials, um, and Trump says, bring our troops home. Well, um, I think I agree with that, but we'd like to hear what some of you think about this, too. Then we'll be discussing a few of Trump's tweets. Um, you know, those are always interesting and quite enlightening. And Joe Biden blasts the Ukrainian president after political report. Plus, the mayor of Livermore, California, explains Trump's popularity and success. Now, actually, this was an article that was written a year ago, but um, I felt it was definitely necessary to go over again because it's probably the most right-on-target explanation on why things are just exploding and, and why uh, people love POTUS so much. And also, uh, we're going to go ahead, there was one main Seabine group discussion today on Facebook, and I'm going to go over what some of the people were talking about and what their thoughts were. would love to hear what you have to say. And it has to do with the rumors of UN vehicles transported on the highways. Okay, so all of these news releases and much more are posted in detail, as I mentioned, on our Seavine website. Go there daily for up-to-the-minute news. These daily news, uh, YouTube news videos are just meant to give you the highlights. I already went over that. Okay, military tribunal briefs. Click on the links to read the full articles. Now, there are two main reports to start off the three-week straight tribunal uh, episode that we had uh, just this last month, it was towards the end of the month, three weeks straight, including through the actual 9-11 uh, uh, anniversary of what this was going on. And boy, it, a lot was happening. So uh, it's the 9-11 the pre-trials are also called the KSM at Al trials. And if you've already been told about this, bear with me a minute to help me bring others up to speed because we're going to, what I'm going to be doing now is on a daily basis, I'm going to give you a Gitmo update instead of doing one long, hour and a half long uh, Gitmo update having to do with an entire week 
of transcriptions and uh, you know, various different trials that had gone on. It's like kind of hard to keep your eyes open through it. So I'm going to try this where every single night on the daily evening news, I'm just going to give you a little clip on what went on. And all these will be done by the time we go to the next tribunals. So unfortunately, an outrageous amount of people are woefully uninformed because of no mainstream media coverage. All right, well, why these pretrials? This is one thing uh, that was very difficult for me to bring up, but there is good news after this, so um, hold on to your hat, so to speak. But there was one uh, news quest that I had to do on why these pretrials may never make it to trial. Um, and this was a news release that I did actually on September 11th, and in brief, what it talks about, if you think about 9-11 happened in 2001. It's 2019 right now. Did you know that we still haven't gone to trial? All of these that have been going on for all these years have been in pretrial basis. And so this article that we have here, and I'm not going to go over all of it, but I'm just going to give you the highlights, and you can take the time to read about it. Uh, when you go to the website, but for the most part, what it says is the first uh, couple of years after the tribune, or excuse me, after 2001 9-11 happened, that horrible attack, um, they didn't catch Khalid Sheikh Mohammed until 2003. And they had uh, collected four other people also, and so they're trying them all together. There's five people being tried at once, the KSM et al, a military tribunals. And so what happened is for the first, um, it was about four or five years, they were in what was called black sites, which is where they did enhanced interrogation. In other words, torture. And to find out whatever information it was that they could. And then they started the pretrials I believe it was in 2005. <clears throat> and they went uh, quite a few years uh, from there. It was just about five, six years in the pretrials. They were moving along. And then Obama decided to change the rules, so to speak, and said that nothing that was ever uh, obtained under enhanced interrogation could be used in court. In other words, it was inadmissible. So they had to shut the trials down. Everything was closed out. It couldn't move forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so after that, they had to do some plans on what they were going to do if they couldn't use the uh, quote-unquote confessions because it was against their will when they gave the information. They came up with uh, something that's called clean teams. That's like clean, like Mr. Clean. Clean teams. And that is something that the FBI do, and they are not allowed to get any information um, unless uh, it's given willfully. And I'll have to tell you about that. So those uh, trials started in 2012. And they have been going until now, these pretrials. The problem is, the problem is there's been so many shenanigans and so many problems going on um, within these pretrials, plus the fact that uh, Bush, when this first came about, he changed the tribunal rules. And for the most part, uh, from what I've been able to see, is it's pretty much been weaponized. It's, it's uh, constantly going round and round and round in circles that they can never come to any foregone conclusions in the end. Everything's appealed. It continues moving forward. Things are uh, delayed, delayed, delayed constantly. And so uh, that's what's been going on for these past seven years. And then there was the main shen shenanigans. Um, before the shenanigans happened, it has been said that these trials can find a guilty verdict 
with just the information that they have now, with the confessions and everything they have now. They can do a guilty, guilty verdict. But they don't mention a couple of other things that were really important. Like, for instance, one of the witnesses, the CIA witnesses to the torture that heard the actual confessions, etc., initially um, in those first years, uh, was also a linguist and identified the voices that they had uh, about six months before 9-11 happened when they had all that chatter on the phone and they were planning 9-11. The FBI had taped phone calls for that. And this linguist, you know, was able to identify the voices. They knew what was going on six months in advance. But anyway, I'm not going to go over the whole thing. This, this, um, <laughs> CIA witness retired out of the CIA. Well, guess where this person got a job? On the defense team of the terrorist. The defense team. It was found out in court one day, in closed proceedings, which was another thing, that uh, three of the other alleged terrorists recognized this uh, CIA uh, witness who was sitting next to one of the other um, alleged terrorists, Al Belushi. They all recognized who this was. And so basically this uh, CIA witness retired and went and got a job on the defense team. And that's a big, big no-no. And so that has been another thing that uh, they're getting ready to throw everything out of court. There was a, a, a little old man in the uh, actual trials when we went to go see them. Uh, every single time he was there with his wife, mentioned to me one time and then another time to Leonard Bacani, another time to one of the other volunteers that went to these. There was a total of four of us on four separate occasions that this gentleman who was there always at the proceedings, uh, the Gitmo proceedings, was bragging about how he was the father of the defense attorney for uh, KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And so he was very proud of it, and there's nothing wrong with that. But he told each and every single one of us separately, because he didn't know we knew each other, that he said, these pretrials are never going to make it to court. They're never going to make it. It's not going to happen. And I and everyone else is like, why not? Why wouldn't it? Well, now after all this is going on, I can see why that is the case. And so we go over all of that in this actual article. And uh, this is uh, a link that you can click on to go ahead and read it. I highly recommend you do if you haven't looked at it already. But there is good news. And the good news is because of our Attorney General Barr. Now, <laughs> William Barr has uh, the, let me back up, the family members and the victims, the victims and the family members of the victims are always at the tribunals in Guantanamo Bay. They kind of switch off, uh, each of them going to the trials, pre-trials as they uh, move forward, have been suing in court for many, many years to have the names released of not only what was uh, considered classified within the taped recordings initially, but also in 2012, there was a federal court case where it, um, in open proceedings, they redacted out, excuse me, closed proceedings, they redacted out the name of a Saudi official that was uh, basically stated that this was the individual that was actually the main mastermind. And so the family members and the victims of 9-11 you know, have been suing in court after court after court to have those names released. And they're always turned down and they go up to the next highest court and et cetera. Well, finally it got to the point where it was put on in front of William Barr. And he had until September 12th, which was the day after September 11th, to make a decision on whether or not he was going to declassify this name or if he was going to continue and keep it classified. And 
that is when, even though I, for a long time, I really debated about letting people know what I had been told and uh, what a number of people already knew about the pretrials not going anywhere. After I heard this, I decided on September 11th to release the information that I had found out that these these trials were never going to be able, these pretrials were never going to trial, even though the judge has set a trial date for January 11th, 2021. Not 2020, 2021. So that'll make it a good even 20 years after 9-11 happened, that it'll finally be going to court. <laughs> so that's why I thought, okay, let's, let's speed this up because every closed proceeding, you know, they, they wouldn't allow us to uh, know anything of what was going on uh, in what these names were. So I went ahead and released it. And the next day, Barr did make an announcement and uh, this entire article will explain exactly what it was and what has been happening. And so he did decide to release the, um, uh, the person's name that it was a Saudi official, but he decided to do it to the actual attorneys of uh, the defense team uh, because they didn't know, uh, you know, except for what the uh, alleged terrorist told them. And also they released it to the attorneys, to the family members and the victims, and they released it to the attorneys representing uh, the individuals in Saudi. So they did release those. Now the reason this is so important and why I'm taking the time to go over this, because it's gonna make all the difference in the world and has made all the difference in the world, is because this information, um, the tribunals in preparation for what Barr's information was going to be, it, <laughs> they went ahead and they closed the proceedings on the 12th, which was the next day, and the 13th, which was Friday, and Saturday, and Sunday. So all these proceedings were closed for the very reason of in anticipation to Barr's release of this name. In other words, they were out of time. They couldn't do any more of the shenanigans and the games that they were doing. Things were moving forward. People know what's going on. So, Monday. <laughs> Talking about a difference between night and day. Night and day. Um, on that Monday, uh, everything in the past that was considered classified, not everything, but most things, that were considered classified were wide open. Most of the trials, the pre-trials for the rest of the couple of weeks that were left were in open court when usually they were always, and they were fighting and arguing to keep it in closed court. It was an open court. And so we heard things that we haven't heard before. And they went over all of the various different things of you know what happened with torture, what type of torture they used, the repercussions of that, the information they got from the torture. Then they also talked about the clean teams and you know what they they got from that. And so huge amount of information. That's all I'm going to tell you about it tonight because it's already quite a bit. I just wanted to catch you up. And so tomorrow, I'm going to go over um, what exactly the torture techniques were, what they were doing, and uh, some of the information that came out about that. So stay tuned for that. All right, so going back, let's go ahead and now uh, move away from our Gitmo corner, which was what that was, um, to go into today's news. Today's breaking news, Monday, October 7th. Okay, Trump says bring our soldiers home. Well, that's what he's going to do, and I love it. It says, um, President Trump says, bring our soldiers home from these endless, ridiculous wars. The United States was supposed to be in Syria, Syria for 30 days, and that was many years ago. We stayed and got deeper and deeper into battle with no aim in sight. When I arrived in Washington, ISIS was running rampant in the area. We quickly defeated 100% of the ISIS caliphate. 
we quickly defeated 100% of the ISIS caliphate, including capturing thousands of ISIS fighters, mostly from Europe, Trump said on Twitter. Well, isn't that interesting? Okay, so uh, Trump on troop withdraw withdrawal from Syria. Time to get out of these ridiculous, endless wars. President Trump explains the rationale behind the decision to pull all American troops from Syria, saying that he wants the United States to get out of these ridiculous, endless wars. The White House announced on October 6th that American troops would pull out of northern Syria Syria and hand over responsibility for captured ISIS members to Turkey. The United States Armed Forces will not support or be involved in the operation and the United States uh, forces, having defeated the ISIS territorial caliphate, will no longer be in the immediate area, the White House said in a statement. Trump issued a statement early Monday explaining the reasoning behind the decision. Okay, he already said this, so I'm not going to repeat it over. He said, Europe would not take back the captured fighters and try to make the United States take responsibility for them, even if they were nationals of other countries. Europe didn't want them back, they said. You keep them in USA. And I said, no, we did you a great favor, and now you want us to hold them in the U.S. prisons at tremendous cost. They are yours for trials. They again said no, thinking as usual that the U.S. is always the sucker on NATO, on trade, on everything, Trump says. Almost three years, but it's time for us to get out of these ridiculous, endless wars, many of them tribal and bringing our soldiers home. We will fight where it is to our benefit and only fight to win. Turkey, Europe, Syria, Iran, Iraq, Russia, and the Kurds will now have to figure the situation out and what they want to do with the captured ISIS fighters in their neighborhood. They all hate ISIS, have been enemies for years. We are 7,000 miles away and will crush ISIS again if they come anywhere near us. Trump noted that the Kurdish fighters fought alongside the United States and that animus exists between the Kurds and Turkey, but said America couldn't hold off any longer. I held off this fight for almost three years, but it's time to get out. This is ridiculous, etc. And then he also makes a tweet, which I thought was interesting. I was just going to go ahead and read it here. As I've stated strongly before, and just to reiterate, if Turkey does anything that I, in my great and unmatched wisdom, consider to be off limits, I will totally destroy and obliterate the economy of Turkey. I've done it before. They must, with Europe and others, watch over the captured ISIS fighters and families. The U.S. has done far more than anyone could have ever expected, including the capture of 100% of the ISIS caliphate. It is now time for others to be in the region, some of great wealth, to protect their own territory. The USA is great. So... I'm just going to bring that over. Now, going on to the actual next article, Joe Biden blasts the Ukrainian president after political report. <laughs> well, blasting the president is an understatement. Um, he basically said, and I'm not going to say the word, you effed up. And this is an exclusive report. Joe Biden blasted Ukrainian president after political report reveals Biden's role in 2016 DNC election interference. A Ukrainian source has revealed that former Vice President Joe Biden was furious about an article in Political that revealed election interference and collusion between the government of Ukraine and the Democratic National Committee. Biden let out his anger with Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko on his January 15, 2017 trip to uh, Ki Ki Kiev, 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 sorry, Ukraine, reportedly telling the foreign leader, you effed up. What we were working on all leaked to the press. The new disclosure indicates that Biden had much more significant role in the 2016 election interference by Democrats close to Hillary Clinton than had previously been revealed. After Biden's outburst, Poroshenko then called in a former Ukrainian official who he believed to be the whistleblower and threatened him. 
The Ukrainian whistleblower was later forced to flee Ukraine, fearing for his safety. The Kiev Post article from January 2017 confirmed that Biden was in the Ukraine shortly after the political article's release and met with Poroshenko. The political article, Ukrainian Efforts to Sabotage Trump Backfire, detailed how a longtime DNC operative named Alexandria Chalupa worked directly with the Ukrainian embassy to attempt to get dirt on then-candidate Trump in an attempt to tie him to Russia. One of the most chilling parts of that article revealed that Chalupa had told Ukrainian officials that the Democrats planned hearings prior to the election attempting to be attempting to tie Trump to Russia months before the alleged DNC hack was revealed and months before Glenn Simpson claimed he hired Christopher Steele to write the now disgraced Steele dossier. Chalupa admitted that she was working with Ohio liberal Democrat Marcy Kaptur. Chalupa confirmed that a week after the Manafort's hiring was announced, she discussed the possibility of a congressional investigation with a foreign policy legislative assistant in the office of Representative Marcy Kaptur, Democrat Ohio, who co-chairs the Congressional Ukrainian Caucus. But Chalupa said it didn't go anywhere. Ask about the effort. The Kaptur legislative assistant called it a touchy subject in an internal email to colleagues that was accidentally forwarded to political. Kaptur's office later emailed an official statement explaining that the lawmaker is backing a bill to create an independent commission to investigate possible outside interference in our elections. The office added, at this time, the evidence related to this matter points to Russia, but congressional woman Kaptur is concerned with any evidence of foreign entities interfering in our elections. This article that angered Biden also revealed that Chalupa was working closely with Trump-hating reporter Michael Ishkoff and coordinating with the communications director, Louis Miranda, who was handpicked for the position by Hillary Clinton's team. Okay, those details came out of an email published by WikiLeaks. Politico wrote in the email, which was sent in early May to then DNC communications director, Louis Miranda, Chalupa noted that she had extended an invitation to the Library of Congress forum to veteran Washington investigative reporter, Michael Ishkoff. Two days before the event, he had published a story for Yahoo News revealing the unraveling of a $26 million deal between Manafort and a Russian ol oligarch related to the telecommunications venture in Ukraine. And Chalupa wrote in the email that she'd been working with for the, the past few weeks, said Ishkov, and connected him to the Ukrainians at the event. The Ukrainian whistleblower has expressed an interest in talking to President Trump directly about the matter, as well as other issues related to Joe Biden's influence in the Ukraine. This is a developing investigation. Well, isn't that interesting? Okay, so what I wanted to go over was um, the mayor of Livermore, California, explains Trump's popularity and, express, and it, it success. The mayor of Livermore, California, explains Trump's popularity and success. This is perhaps the best explanation for Trump's popularity. And this was actually published June 16, 2018, but it's a definite interest. Marsha Carmina is a registered Democrat and was elected mayor of Livermore, California. He ran on the Democratic ticket as he knew a Bay Area city would never vote for a Republican. He is a conservative. He's as a conservative as they come. He wrote the following from an article originally written by Evan Sayet, and his opinion he expressed as a columnist for townhall.com were his own and did not represent the views of townhall.com or mistakenly attributed to Marshall Kamenta by me. Trump's lack of decorum, dignity, and statemanship by Evan Sayet in his article, He Fights. My leftist friends, as well as many other ardent never-Trumpers, constantly ask me if I'm not bothered by the Donald Trump lack of decorum. 
They ask if I don't think his tweets are both beneath the dignity of his office. <laughs> well, my answer, we, we right-thinking people have tried dignity. There could not have been a man of more quiet dignity than George W. Bush. Okay, I'm cringing reading this, I know. But this, just listen to the article. Let's move forward. As he suffered the outrageous lies of political motivated hatreds that undermined his presidency, we tried statementship. Could there be another human being on this earth who was so desperately prized collegically as John McKay? Okay, another cringeworthy statement there. I don't agree with that, but that's what it says. We tried propriety. There has there has there been a nicer human being than Mitt Romney. And the results were always the same. This is because we were playing by the rules of dignity, collegiality, collegiality and propriety, and the left has been, for the past 60 years, engaged in a knife fight where the only rules are those of Saul Alinsky and the Chicago mob. I don't find anything dignified, collegial, or proper about Barack Obama's lying about what went down on the streets of Ferguson in order to ramp up racial hatreds because racial hatreds serve the Democratic Party. I don't see anything dignified in lying about the deaths of our four Americans in Baghdadi and imprisoning an innocent filmmaker to cover your tracks. I don't see anything statesmanlike in weaponizing the IRS to be used to destroy your political opponent opponents in any dissent. Yes, Obama was articulate and polished, but no way was he in the least bit dignified, collegial, or proper. The left has engaged in a war against America since the rise of the children of the 60s. To them, it has been an all-out war where nothing held sacred and nothing is seen is beyond the pale. It has been a war they fought with violence, the threat of violence, demagoguery, and lies from day one. The violent takeover of the universities, etc., until today. The problem is that through these years, the left has been the only side fighting this war. While the left has been taking a knife to anyone who stands in their way, the right has continued to act with dignity, collegiality, and propriety. With Donald Trump, this has come to an end. Donald Trump is America's first wartime president in a culture war. During wartime, things like dignity and collegiality simply aren't the most essential qualities one looks for in their warriors. Ulysses Grant was a drunk whose behavior in peacetime might well have seen him drummed out of the army for conduct unbecoming. Had Abraham Lincoln applied the peacetime rules for propriety and booted Grant, the Democrats might well still be holding their slaves today. Lincoln rightly recognized that I cannot spare this man. He fights. General George Patton was a vulgar talking. Vulgar talking. In peacetime, this might have seen him stripped of his rank, but had Franklin Roosevelt applied the normal rules of decorum, then Hitler and the socialists would barely be five decades into their thousand-year Reich. Trump is fighting, and that's what's particularly delicious, is that Patton standing over the battlefield, as his tanks obliterated Rommel's, he shouted, you magnificent bastards, I read your book. That is just the icing on the cake, but it is wonderful to see, it's, but it's wonderful to see that not only is Trump fighting, he's defeating the left using their own tactics. The book is Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, the book so essential to the liberals' war against America that it is and was the playbook for the entire Obama administration and the subject of Hillary Clinton's senior thesis. It is a book of such pure evil that just as the rest of us would dedicate our book to those we love or those whom we are most indebted, Alinsky dedicated his book to Lucifer. Trump's tweets may seem rash and unconsidered, but in reality, he's doing exactly what Alinsky suggested his followers do. First, instead of going after the fake media, and they are so fake that they have literally gotten every single significant story of the past 60 years, not just wrong, but diametrically opposed to the truth. From the Tet Offensive to Benghazi to what really happened on the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, Trump isolated CNN. He made it personal. Then just as Alinsky suggests, 
He employs ridicule, which Alinsky described as the most powerful weapon of all. Most importantly, Trump's tweets have put CNN in the untenable and unwinnable position. They need to respond. This leaves them with only two choices. They can either go high, as Hillary would disingenuously declare of herself, and the fake news would disingenuously report as the truth, and begin to honestly and accurately report the news, or they can double down on their usual tactics and hope to defeat Trump with their twice than usual hysteria and demagoguery. The problem for CNN at Al with the former is that if they were to start honestly reporting the news, that would be the end of the Democrat party they serve. It is nothing but the incessant use of fake news, read propaganda, that keeps the left alive. Imagine, for example, if CNN had honestly and accurately reported the candidate Barack Obama's close ties to foreign terrorist Rashid Khalid, domestic terrorist William Ayers and Bernadine Dome, the mafia Tony Rezko, or the true evils of his spiritual mentor, Jeremiah Wright's church. Imagine if they had honestly and accurately conveyed the evils of Obama administration's weaponizing of the IRS to be used against their political opponents, or his running of guns to the Mexican cartels, or the truth about the murder of Ambassador, Ambassador Christopher Stevens and the Obama administration's cover-up. So to my friends on the left and the never Trumpers as well, do I wish I lived in a time when our president could be collegial and dignified and proper? Of course I do. Those aren't, these aren't the times. This is war. <coughs> Excuse me. And it is a war that the left has been fighting without opposition for the past 50 years. So say anything you want about this president. I get it. He can be vulgar. He can be crude. He can be undignified at times. I don't care. I can't spare this man. He fights for America. So I really thought that was great. <coughs> okay. Now, there was one last topic, and then I'm going to close out for tonight is going over to uh, you know, the uh, CBine group page on Facebook. We are posting a lot of our articles that we do on the website every single day. We post it there and then we post some of the news stories inside the Facebook page. And so that's where we have quite a few people that show up and they comment on the articles we watch everything very closely. We don't allow people to post actual news stories on this Facebook group page. We have people that vet the news before it is allowed to go there. And you absolutely um, are encouraged to comment, even debate. You can argue. You can do whatever it is you want, discuss. The whole idea is to research and come to the truth. And uh, it just basically discuss the article that is up there and we found out a lot of things a lot of people just chipping in and helping with research besides the research team that we have has gone very far now mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and read off my phone because there are some things here that are just going to be too difficult to see but today one of the things that were coming up is a lot of people on Twitter were reporting seeing UN vehicles being, um, you know, in mass taken down the highway in a couple of different places. And, you know, some had been doing pictures, some, uh, you know, showing video of uh, things going on trains. And it's just one of the things that that's going on right now is, of course, there's so much chaos and so much desperation on the left it's again hard to tell exactly what is true and what isn't. So I went ahead and I posted this one article. I found five comments in a row and each of them said something that was the truth, it was absolutely the truth. So what do you do with that? How do you pick out, you know, if every single thing is the truth, how do you handle that? 
And so this is the post. I ask everyone to click on the screenshot to fully expand it, which was the five different comments. If each comment on the screenshot is true, take special note of Peter Quee's statement, and then what will a calm patriot do? One of Obama's last executive orders that he was madly putting out before he left office, remember that in the end, executive orders right and left, etc. <clears throat> One of them was he was giving the UN the ability to enter the US to calm unrest. Why do you think the deep state is always trying to provoke unrest with Antifa and other shenanigans? Thankfully, Americans have remained calm and have treated POTUS leadership abilities to handle this. I know everything has been prepared and is doing everything he can to protect us. But the other comments were true also. Read them. Rumors are running rampant and most of our members are being careful of their fact checking. I was really proud of you guys. But no fear, we are the storm. Tough it up and keep your head on swivel. You are not alone. See something, say something. If it is a post, be sure you verify it at first before spreading it. We've been wanting action to be taken. Just know POTUS has got this. We've got this. Action has been taken behind the scenes for the last couple of years. What you are seeing now are the death throes of a cornered dying beast because of effective actions that's been taken for the last couple of years. But keep in mind, a cornered beast is the most dangerous kind of beast. So you must stay alert. Be aware of your surroundings without walking in complacency, and that should be a way you should be anyway. Use discernment. And so when I took a picture of these uh, uh, five quotes, there was um, one thing one person said, which was absolutely true, besides what Peter Quee's uh, statement was, which I'll tell you in a minute. There are no UN vehicles driving around the U.S. in the U.S. marked UN, marked UN. They are U.S. vehicles that are destined to be transported out to other countries for their use. They routinely use the highway to get them to the docks or other um, rendezvous area for further transport. Don't be paranoid and know that there is no enforced UN authority in the U.S., period. Okay, that was another true statement. And then somebody else said, I have view, a view of a very small portion of Interstate 40 <clears throat> comparatively, and I have seen quite a few semis hauling what appears to be military vehicles in recent days. I have not seen UN vehicles, at least not any that were recognizable as such. And then Peter Kui said, Reach the, uh, research the Kigali principle. Obama signed the agreement with the UN in December 2016 to allow the UN to send troops into the USA to control civil unrest, example, militarized uprising by Antifa in major cities. Okay, so this is some of the comments that were made. And then uh, there were, I'm just going to read three of them to you that had some outstanding insights. This one is by KDK. Obama's order specifically mentioned the UN deploying if martial law was declared, not civil unrest. President Trump declared a special state of emergency. The UN has no legal basis to deploy on that condition. I consulted a constitutional scholar on it at the time. The special state of emergency gives POTUS the power needed with different legal terms, but the same effect. I met a UN official about two years ago. I asked him if he was a friend or foe. He blankly stared at me and said nothing. They are not our friends. And then um, Deborah Thane said, okay, help me out here. If Peter Quee's post is helpful, <clears throat> Obama signed the agreement, the deep state is Antifa, and, and so is UN. What good is that? And then there was a response, Deborah Thane, exactly right. But POTUS is a good chess player, and I'm sure he has been dealing with it. 
Peter Quee's post is helpful in that we shouldn't walk around with our heads up in the clouds. Being alert is not being paranoid. And telling people to be alert is not fear-mongering. There are those trying to hurt our country, and that is a fact. Then there is one last statement I'm going to talk about, and there are many more that are very interesting. This is a, a statement put out by Peter Char Charles Miller. The UN was established to put a deep state foothold into the United States. That was something that Wilson wanted at the end of his presidency and couldn't get. It is no coincidence that the FBI, CIA, and UN were established fairly quickly in the 20th century to establish operatives here under a fake reasoning. The deep state is multi-generational and very patient in their plans, understanding that they won't win it all in one war or operation. They are like a boa constrictor, working on an animal slowly, killing it. They funded multiple wars in the 19th century in Europe until countries and leaders gave in to ridiculous peace treaties, treaties that were broken anyway. <clears throat> when they were ready to move on to their next stage, they, recreate, they created World War I and World War II as well as the Great Depression in the United States. The establishment of the Federal Reserve allowed for the deep state to manipulate our economy to create both booms and artificial drops in the economy based on lies generated from deep within the cabal. When JFK figured out what they were up to in the CIA with George H.W. Bush, he tried to warn us. That didn't end well for him or anyone who questioned them, as in Robert Kennedy and Nixon was also removed, as well as we worked on his, and was removed as well, as they worked on his ego until he realized that he was compromised and had to duck for cover and get out of D.C. Ford was a plant because he was in on the Warren Commission along with Bush. Their entire existence has morphed over the eons to become the deep state as we know them today. But that type of organization has always existed within the ruling class of the various continents and empires and kingdoms. Once a group of people get that kind of power, they don't want to give it up, even if that means killing millions or billions of people to maintain it. They don't care about others besides themselves, and that is debatable as well, since they will throw each other under the bus when given the chance, as we've been seeing recently. So basically what this is saying is we are winning, folks, and we will continue to win. And I do believe the Lord is watching out over us. But we also need to be wise. You need to be wise. You don't go around in a state of such complacency without uh, being alert. Be aware of your surroundings. And as I mentioned before, right now, the cabal, the deep state, however you want to classify it is, for the most part, is cornered. They're like a cornered animal, and that can be very dangerous. So I don't know about these UN vehicles. I don't know if it's just a bunch of hooey to, I don't know, cause more fear and division. All I know is anything is possible right now. Don't believe everything you see here. Um, it, watch what happens, etc. Fact check everything. Fact check everything. Join us here in Sevi. We've got a huge group of volunteers. That's what we all do, is we fact check it before we put it out. And join a family of like-minded individuals. We're very careful on who we listen to and um, what news that we put out there. So for the most part this evening, folks, um, that's really all that I was going to talk to you about. I would like to let you know that in this article that is on c-find.com, as all these articles and many are more are, and continue every single day with brand new articles, um, there also is some information from the Office of Military Commissions about the KSM et al. 9-11 transcripts for download. So we have a thing here for the DOD website. We have a calendar of the Gitmo proceedings. You can click on this and take you to it. Um, and also we have every single transcript for the last three weeks that are here for your download. Um, in other parts of the website, we actually have downloaded them already. If you would rather look at them that way, have all that information there for you. So hopefully 
um, this will be helpful to you. Now, I'm going to be improving myself in doing these nightly news because I'm just a citizen journalist. I'm kind of <laughs> learning as I go, making it up as I go. But um, we've got quite a few people, a team that is working behind us. So this is the homepage on Seavine. And um, you can see we've got military tribunals, world news, education, we've got the forum, we've got a store, we got a donation page, which is very helpful if you do donate because we do go to the tribunals. It helps to take care of our expenses. A way to contact us. And uh, then there's a place for Trump tweets. There's opinion sections. There's so much on this website, c-vine.com. Well, for the most part, that's it, everybody. I really appreciate you joining me this evening. And please leave some comments below on what I need to do to improve. I'm trying, folks. Okay, good night, everybody.